So we'll now approach Uranus and Neptune with the same thought process that we used to approach Jupiter and Saturn by comparing the planet to the original god that was named after to the music we'll figure out why the planets were given those names associated with the gods and that's going to be associated with the way the planets look the appearance and that idea of how they appear is going to be something that we're going to be able to expect and these will then find that the way they are is also something we're going to be able to expect so after learning things from Jupiter and Saturn, we can just transfer that knowledge and then expect things with Uranus and Neptune in terms of their rings and their color and their density that then turn out to be true. Finally, after a lot of nodding our heads and seeming smug because we came across things that we knew would be true, we'll land find something that shows up our limitations. Let's start off with the gods and the music and the planets. So this is Uranus. Here's the key things about Uranus, the Greek god Uranus. He was primordial, i.e. in mythology, Uranus had no dad. Or to put it another way, came from chaos, conceived in chaos, otherwise known as ab initio, in the beginning. Before there was chaos, and then the order came out of chaos, and Uranus is the god that came out of that previous chaos. Now, in Greek mythology, that's not a compliment. In Greek mythology, being born in chaos means you're still in chaos. So if Saturn was this mostly in the background transitional god that was a little bit weird, then Uranus is completely in the background very weird god. Still a powerful god but kind of also like a little bumbling fool. Let's listen to the music. Almost like Jupiter, right? But then what's this weird thing? All of a sudden, the music was all tricky. Like an accident prone performance. So it's like a combination between uh, a court jester and the court magician. This performer who might be far powerful, but who is also weird. Powerful, but bumbling. That's Uranus, the god, that's Uranus, the music, this is Uranus, the planet. It's tilted over sideways. This planet was born in chaos. This planet may seem bland, featureless, greeny blue, but the key feature is it's tilt. It's 90 degrees tilted, it's almost completely sideways. The north pole of this planet points towards the sun. So this planet came from a chaotic beginning, bumbling, maybe hit by some other giant impactor, like the one that, uh, like the one that caused our moon, or maybe the one that turned Venus up, or maybe tugged sideways by the pull of the other Jovian planets, we're not quite sure yet. Now when Uranus was discovered, it was not discovered, it was not known it was tilted. It was known it was far away. It was the last planet known at that time. And so there was this feeling is that must be the end of order. And so if you go from Jupiter to Saturn and Saturn to Uranus, you start going back down through the ordered gods into the chaotic gods. That's where the Uranus name comes from. But now we know it's a perfect name because of that strange chaotic tilt, just like a court jester. When you look at the statistics about Uranus, it's definitely not a terrestrial planet, but it's not as big as Jupiter and Saturn. It's only about four times as far across. So it's only about a few times bigger than the great red spot on Jupiter. So it's much, much smaller than Jupiter, bigger than Earth, smaller than Jupiter. And even its mass, it's 15 Earth masses, not 90 like Saturn or over 300 like Jupiter. So it's bigger, but not so much bigger. It's 
twice as far away from the sun as Saturn is, so it's a long way away, which means it takes a long time to go around the sun once, 84 years. Still rotates pretty fast. The key thing, as we said, is the tilt, which is just weird. One of the other key weird things we'll find is the moons of Uranus are a little bit weird as well. This one down here in the bottom right, this is the moon called Miranda. And this one almost looks like it's two moons joined together. There's these weird raggedy shapes that still are not understood. Something to do with some sort of leftover tectonic activity, maybe. That's Uranus. Keep a hold of Uranus. Let's now look at Neptune. Neptune is one of those Greek or Roman gods that everybody knows. Neptune is the god with the trident, right? Neptune is the god of the sea. Now, in Greek or Roman times, it was not a compliment to be the god of the chaos at the beginning of time, like Uranus. It was also not a compliment to be a god of the chaos at the end of space. That was Neptune. You see, in Greek or Roman times, there was the Mediterranean, and then there was a sea, and beyond the sea, well, here be dragons. The sea was the end of order. And so the water god was a chaos god. The water god also represented chaos. Indeed, the water, the sea, to the, Greek, to the Greeks and the Romans, was like the final step into the unknown. It was what was beyond the water? What else is out there? Let's listen to the music. You can hear it, right? It's spooky, eerie, watery, irregular. There's this feeling of going into the unknown, it's the last step of order. It's like a chasm opens up and you're stepping into some weird void or you're floating through space, through Neptune's watery depths. In the same way that Uranus was the last known planet at that time, and therefore is named after a god of chaos, Neptune was also then the last known planet of that time. So it was named after the other god of chaos, but the god of weirdness and space, whereas Uranus was the god of weirdness and time, beginning of time, end of space. So Neptune and Uranus, very similar naming conventions. We saw what Uranus was like as a planet. Here's what Neptune's like as a planet. Look how similar it is to Uranus. Four times the diameter of the Earth, 17 times the mass of the Earth. Uranus was 20 AU, Neptune's 30 AU, which means it takes 165 years to go around. Uh, it's got an 18 hour rotation, Ur Uranus is more like 17. It's still that blue green color. One of the other weird things with Neptune is it has this spot, which is kind of like the giant red spot, just much smaller and blue. So there's our two planets, our final two planets in our family, Uranus and Neptune. Let's talk about the family. Because we found our brothers and sisters and we found facets of people that to me represent the planets. And then we went to the big powerful all powerful father, and then he went to the weird, always in the background, grandparent. What are we talking about now? Well, we have to be talking about things that are chaotic and weird and far away, not there very often. So here's the concepts I'm dealing with when I try to think of a character that to me represents Uranus and to me represents Neptune. So this is my Uranus. So with Uranus, I'm looking for chaotic, goofy, mystical, magical, just like that weird uncle that comes to Thanksgiving dinner. You see him once a year. He does magic. Maybe he smokes things that isn't entirely legal depending on what state you're in. You know that guy? He's, you know, harmless, but you still wouldn't want to leave your kid alone with him in case your kid goes missing, right? Maybe he's a magician, maybe he's mystical, maybe he's just goofy, but he's weird. He's definitely chaotic. chaotic. So that's Uranus. 
So if Uranus is going to be your chaotic uncle, then to me, Neptune is your weird, mystical, chaotic aunt. The one who is a little eerie, mystical, maybe she is a mystic. She's a little lackadaisical, maybe she's a traveler, maybe she's a poet, maybe she does a lot of yoga. That's what we're talking about here. That's our family. Weird, right? Well, yeah, families are weird. So everybody's family's weird. And that way we're all the same. That's not the end of the family. Next time around, next week, we start to meet the cousins. And there's a lot of cousins. So be ready to meet all the cousins. But let's finish this segment off by doing that comparisons of Uranus and Neptune to Jupiter and Saturn. And let's take things we know, apply them to different objects, and then realize why things are the way they are. Because this is really a case of similar but different. These four large Jovian planets all started off with roughly the same planetesimal. Something about 10 times the mass of the Earth as a planetesimal. Uranus and Neptune, maybe not quite 10 times the mass of the Earth, maybe more like 7 or 8. But still much bigger than the Earth. Now I note, they may have all started that way, but now you've distinctly got different Jovian planets. Neptune and, and Uranus grew from 7 or 8 or maybe 10 Earth masses to now being 15. And they're blue. Whereas Jupiter and Saturn grew from starting at about 10 Earth masses to now being 90 and 300. And they're red. So there has to be some combinations here. Whatever is true to make Jupiter and Saturn the way, they, the way they are, we should be able to just take that lesson and push it out in further into the solar system and we should be able to explain why Uranus and Neptune present themselves the way they do. Here's one thing we can do, right? These, as Uranus and Neptune are big planets that are far away, they should have rings. They should have dark rings. They do have dark rings. Uranus and Neptune have rings that are barely visible, at least nothing compared to Saturn's brightness. They're extremely dark. That's what we expect, right? These are big planets, which means they're going to cause big tidal stretching effect on any object that comes too close. And if the object comes within that rush limit, it'll break up. The pieces will form small pieces that will form rings. Unless you've got shepherd moons, the rings will eventually darken and they'll eventually fall into the planet. And so we've got dark rings around Uranus and Neptune, just as we thought. Okay, we don't need to learn that. That's exactly what we thought it should be. How about moons? These are big planets far away. So we should expect Neptune and Uranus to have a large number of small weird orbit moons, just like Jupiter and Saturn. And then maybe a few, one, two, three, four, normal big moons. We expect a small number of big moons in ordered orbits because they were formed there, left over in the disk after the planet formed. And then we should have a lot of small captured moons, which are basically asteroids or comets that wandered in too close and get captured into weird orbits. On Uranus, we see five reasonably big moons. Notice all the moons of Uranus are all named after Shakespearean characters. And then there's a large number of really, really small moons. On Neptune, we really only see one big moon, that's Triton. And then we see a lot of other smaller moons. Now, although we see a small number of big moons and a big number of small, a big number of small moons, there's still something weird going on here. So this is Miranda we talked about at the beginning of this lecture. It's one of the so-called bigger moons of Uranus, but it's not that big. It's pretty small for a big moon and look it's got this weird it's more like two moons have combined into each other so it's a little chaotic and we're going to see that the moons of Neptune are extremely chaotic and here's one of the clues you can already see about the chaos of the Neptune moons Triton's the big one but look how far away it is compared to the small ones that's their own way around right so in many ways Uranus and Neptune are similar but Different, similar, but different. Uranus and Neptune are blue, for instance. Why would they be blue? Well, why does anything have any color? The reason why Jupiter and Saturn give out red, and in Jupiter's case, greens and blues, is just because the white, the white light comes in from the sun, but only the red light gets reflected, and so they look red. 
And so why would Uranus and Neptune be blue and green? Well, it must be the opposite reason, right? Saturn appears reddish because the top of the clouds are ammonium hydrosulfide that reflects a red light. So although the light that comes in is all the colors of the rainbow, only the red light gets out and we see the red and the orange. The colors of the planets depend on the colors of the light they absorb and what colors they reflect, and that depends on the different elements you're going to get in the atmosphere. So here's Uranus and Neptune. They must contain something that absorbs the red light, reflects the blue light, and so although all the light comes in, all the colors of the rainbow, only the blues and the greens get out. The molecule that's really, really good at absorbing all the red and only letting the blue and the green die out again is methane. And of course, that's easy to remember because this is Uranus we're talking about, right? The red light gets absorbed. The reds and the greens and the oranges gets the reds and the yellows and the oranges gets absorbed by the methane particles that are in the atmosphere of Uranus and Neptune, which means the only light that can get back out again is the blue. So if you're sitting right here to the left of the screen, you're going to see these planets as being blue. Now that explains why Uranus and Neptune are blue, but as always, it just opens another question. If they're blue because they've got more methane in their atmosphere compared to Jupiter and Saturn, well then the obvious question is, well, why do they have more methane? Where's that coming from? When we pose open questions like this, there's usually one of two answers that explains it. And it's usually mass or distance. In this case, it's distance because distance determines temperature and because composition is determined by temperature. Uranus and Neptune are much further away from the Sun than Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter's around 5 AU, Saturn's around 10. Neptune's at 20 and Uranus is at so Uranus is at 20 and Neptune's at 30. Much further away, where it's much colder. Out there in the depths of space where it's all chaotic, methane freezes into clouds. Why doesn't methane freeze into clouds on Saturn? It's too hot in close. And so it has ammonia hydrosulfide. That's what freezes into clouds on Saturn. But out at Uranus and Neptune, methane can freeze at the very top. That's why we've got a lot of methane in our clouds, and that's why they look to be blues and greens. The answers to all these questions almost always turn out to be some combination of mass and distance. They seem to be the two things that determine the fate of all the planets, and that's to be expected as, 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 because what does gravity depend on? Mass and distance. Mass and distance sets up whether you're going to be a terrestrial planet, an inner planet, or an outer planet, like Jovian planet, like Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, and Saturn. That's just mass and distance. And indeed, distance determines mass. Mass is what determines the uh, Jovians, the, the Jovian gases, that determines that banded structure you see. Distance is what makes it banded, because you can see down to lots of different clouds. Why Saturn look blurrier? Distance. Why Uranus, Neptune different than Saturn and Jupiter? They're smaller in mass, and they're further away, therefore they have a further distance. It's almost always mass and distance. Not just that separates the terrestrial planets, the inner planets, from the outer planets, the Jovian planets, but even within a grouping makes the planets distance different from each other. It's just mass and distance almost all the time. As you get further from the sun, the temperature drops, which means distance is the same as mass. And for these, Big planets form closer, 5 AU and 10 AU. Closer in, methane does not freeze. For these Jovian planets formed further, further away, 20 AU and 30 AU, it's colder. Therefore, methane does freeze. Distance. Mass also matters, right? Being uh, this close in, there's more mass closer. And so Jupiter's got a bigger chance of growing bigger which means it can then get bigger. That's why Jupiter's bigger than Saturn. That's why Saturn's bigger than Uranus. That's why Uranus is bigger than Neptune. Mass begets mass. Mass attracts mass. That's just gravity. As you go further away, when there is less stuff, you can't be big. 
So for those Jovian planets that are formed closer in, like Jupiter and Saturn, where there's more material, they're really big in mass and they're really big in volume. But for those planets formed further away, where there is less stuff, because the disk is thinner, they're smaller in mass and they're much, much smaller in volume. Mass and volume then determines density. And so we can kind of guess what the density of these planets is supposed to be. Jupiter is going to be low density. Saturn is going to be low density because of that big, huge, big gaseous atmosphere. Uranus still has a big gaseous atmosphere, but not as much gas in its atmosphere. So maybe it's got a low density, but a slightly higher one than that of Saturn. And Neptune, further away, probably not as much. Again, so this is where we're going to have a slightly higher density again. So we expect density to go up as we go out. And that is what we find. The density of Saturn, 0.71. The density of Uranus, more. And the density of Neptune, more again. The key with these Jovian planets is to know that you kind of already know this stuff. And you just transfer the knowledge and you come up with the answer. And it's very satisfying when you get the answer, you think it's the right answer. But of course, the best part of science is not when you get the right answer. The best part of science is when this 20 year old kid gets the wrong answer. And we'll do that in the final lecture of this week.